Tread and wear indicators. Now, I was talking about tread and wear indicators, and these are some good examples. Oh, just leave the light on for a second here. I was talking about tread and wear indicators. So, here's an example. Uh, come up later on and take a look at this tire. If you look into the groove, you'll go along, and all of a sudden you'll see a spot where it looks like the rubber has raised a bit in the grooves. Okay, and if that uh, is true, you can take a tread depth gauge, and just next to the spot where you think the rubber raises, take a reading, and then pop it in where the, where the thing, and see if it goes up a sixteenth of an inch, two thirty seconds of an inch. That'll be a tread wear indicator going across. Then go along to you think you spot another one. Mark the sidewall. One, little dash, second dash. From there on in, try something like this. Spread your hands apart, say like that far, and then go like that. You'll probably locate the, the next one. So probably equal distance. There's probably six on. This tire has six. So all I did was I put a little mark each time. Now, got the tire on the vehicle, got the art board laid out in front of it, tire starts rolling, where this line hits, I'll make a little mark. And I call that section one. And this one hits, make a little mark, this one hits, make a little mark, until we get the whole circumference, and then I number them one to six. Now my test impression has located all my wear bars for me. Wherever there's a wear bar, I know where it's at, in case there's some showing up in the cast. Generally, the tire has to be bald for you to see at the crime scene impression. But a cast might pick it up if it's really almost worn down to it. Uh, there's those test impressions over there. You can see they have numbers on them. Okay, so section one, section two, section three. Two has a piece of tape over two, three, four. So if I find section three here is where my transparency fits, I've done my comparison, then I can go back to the tire, section three, and say, okay, this is the area I'm going to look for. And, or maybe there's no cuts or nothing at all. You just match up design and size. You can at least show the court, in my opinion, this is the area that could have made the impression. This is the area where the pitch sequence, or the size of these elements, is, is in agreement with my crime scene impression. Just in case they ask you, well, there's the tire. Never mind showing its test. Show me on the tire where you think the impression could have come from. And you can go right back to it. It's really hard to do without marking. If I didn't have this marked, and I found section 3 on there was the area, for me to come back here and find out where section 3 was, it's almost impossible. You know, because it's, it's reverse order, and it's a scrambled moisture. What's your success at seizing tires? Seizing them? Uh, pretty good. We have reasonable grounds to believe the vehicle is involved. We can seize the vehicle. You might need a warrant, depending if it's been seized as a, you know, as a result of the offense right at the time. We can seize it and hold it for evidence, but if we believe that the vehicle was involved in the crime, we can get a warrant, go seize the vehicle, and hold the tire. I recommend uh, if you've done a comparison that the tires not be released until the court case is over. Because you have not allowed a defense person the opportunity to examine the evidence as well, and that could be enough to just ruin your evidence. So I would, I would hold on to any tire until the case is done. Now, this tire here, <laughs> so they, they're six, they're equally spaced. This tire here has seven. Seven wear bars, and they're not equally spaced. Usually they're six, they're usually equally spaced, but not always. That's not a hard and fast rule. This one has seven, and where they're located is quite unique. Remember what I said with respect to the noise treatment. Here's a wear bar here. The noise treatment in this area is different than the noise treatment where this wear bar is. Fit sequence is different. And this one is bald. The wear bars are showing up. See this bald strip right across here? So these are easy to find. So that's why I mark them and it breaks the impressions up into pieces. 
Now, Arcwood. That's just how wide the impression is. From there to there. You measure as best you can from shoulder to shoulder. Okay? I'm just going to give you another example of arc width right here. Section height is how high the tire is from the beam to the thread. Section width is how wide the tire is from sidewall to sidewall. Arc width is how wide from one shoulder to the other. And as I said, once an impression becomes bald and wearing on the shoulders, on the edge of the tread, it's really hard to specifically say how wide the impression is or to find out that, that exact point where it stops. But it's still a useful measurement to take. The next, um, the next thing, that these are all points to consider when you're doing a comparison, is mold rotation. Mold rotation is the offset in a mold. I said if there was 20 molds, and they were all the same, all making exactly the same size tire, that the tires would be virtually uh, indistinguishable one from the other. You know, if they left crime scene impressions, you couldn't tell because they're so closely uh, reproduced. But the molds, the top and bottom half of the mold, okay, the mold can have the outside edge of the design up here and the inside edge of the design here. The mold closes the tires inside, vulcanizes, and it opens and the tire comes out. That's called a clamshell or a full circle mold. It has two halves and open and closes like a clamshell. That mold can get offset, twisted, that one way or the other by about a tenth of an inch. And then when it gets more than that, they usually you know, take the mold out of production for a little while and, and adjust it and get it back to zero. But see where those two red lines are there? They should be actually lined right up. But the pattern has been twisted slightly. So a slight mold rotation, yes, you can spot that. That is, that is uh, one way to tell two tires that came with the same design size that came from uh, adjacent molds or what have you. Now, the tire industry is going to segmented molds uh, increasingly to segmented molds. That's a mold that has pieces. Think of it as a cake that's been sliced into eight pieces. There's eight sections in the mold. It opens and closes on the tire. And when it opens, it goes out at right angles from the tread. Instead of pulling up like that and tearing out the tread, it comes straight out from the tread. The model comes straight out and then up. So that produces a better quality tire with the type of rubber compounds you're using. And segmented molds don't have mold offset. Okay? Now, a clamshell or full circle mold like that has a seam that runs right around the center. And this is a tire that could have mold offset. Okay? If you look at it, there's a little piece of rubber. Just pick the little piece off right there. That is the seam where the mold flows and a little bit of rubber seeped out. So this is a full circle mold that has a top and a bottom half. Now, Segmented molds have that seam running across like this. Okay, and you can spot them. You just go, you'll see that little uh, flange of rubber running straight across. Okay? So the segmented mold matches and fits perfectly together. It doesn't have this offset problem. So if you you know if you're worried about this mold offset or something, and you've got a segmented tire, you don't have to worry about it. If you've got this type of tire, yes. And if you look at some of these elements right in the middle. You might see what I'm talking about. Let's take a look at a few more here. All right, here's your full circle mold, top and bottom half. Okay. There's a tire going in, radial tire going into the mold. These ones are coming up. Okay, mold's closing on the tire. And if it gets twisted one way or another, see how this center element? This is the same tire, I think, that we're looking at right up here. It's the exact same tire by Goodyear. See this uh, piece of rubber here? How it, the edge comes along and then it drops down about a tenth or a fifth of an inch. Then comes along. Over, up a bit. That's mold offset. A high quality impression, it might show up. 
Now, this is an example that Peter McDonald has in his book. So many of you that um, maybe looked at it and were wondering what he was talking about. This is the crime scene impressions. They took the pitch sequence from that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they found a spot in the impression where they are at, let's say, eight. You know, the groove is quite large, and they're at pitch eight. Here's the tip of one of these grooves, the peak on one of the, on the groove here, and the peak on this one. And these lines should have lined up. They knew that from the back. Okay, next slide. Okay, now this is the suspect tire, and you can see that the little lines almost line up, but they're offset in the opposite direction. The other one was offset this way, and this one's offset this way. So, for that reason, they ruled out that tire. So there you go. This is the um, suspect tire. I mean, this is the crime scene tire, and this is the suspect tire. This is mold offset that way, so this whole half of the pattern is slightly offset that way, and this and then this is uh, a schematic drawing of the suspect's tire. It's offset the opposite way to rule that tire up. Now that was a murder case in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it turned out that Peter McDonald was correct. That vehicle was not the vehicle in question because according to um, Pete and his book, they eventually did apprehend a person who was responsible for the offense. And it wasn't this, this person's vehicle. Was that a directional tire? No, that would be non-directional tire. How would so you turn it upside what? down? If you turn it upside down, turn one of them upside down, then you would have offset in the same direction. Turn no, your diagram that, upside that, down. That, that, no, oh, no, it would be the same. It would be the same, right. If you turn it upside down, it wouldn't matter. It would still be, I mean, the same. still be the same. You know what I mean? This thing yeah. is going to be yeah. over there. It's going to be the same. But the good thing. But, uh, I don't believe this is a directional tire just from looking at it. That's why I say that. Uh, directional tire pattern uh, tends to be like V type, you know, grooves going in form a V shape. Okay, we'll shut the slide thing off there and turn on the lights for a sec. Number of ribs. Uh, that's another thing to look for, okay? That's something that's good to advise the investigator of. Patterns um, can be designed that have uh, six ribs. Six rib radial tire, and for some of the, real, the smaller sizes, like 13 inch or something, you might have to make the same design in a five rib design. Okay, so it won't have six ribs, it'll have five ribs. So, you know, that's what you want to look for. That's one of the things you want to compare. It seems pretty obvious, but six rib tire at the crime scene, they seize a five rib tire, that's it. Comparison ends right there. And also, if you tell the investigator, we're looking for a summer type tread design, not an all season, we're looking for a two six rib tread design, summer type on the front, six ribs, then he's not going to be seizing a vehicle with five rib design or seven rib design. But if all you do is give him a photograph of what it looks like, he might just get the right design and the wrong rib number. So that, I think that's something that's good to bring in, to make a note of in your report and bring to their attention. So that's why I mentioned that. And then non-skid depth. Non-skid depth is uh, the term used by the tire industry for the tread depth. We call it the tread depth. You've heard me referring to that. That's how deep is the, is the gripping tread. Uh, in a crime scene impression, you might be able to measure that with the tread depth gauge or just a ruler. Just try taking a ruler and uh, if it's cut right off at uh, the zero, lower the ruler in, you can actually take a reading quarter of an inch deep, but I recommend you use something like a tread depth gauge because this measures in 30 seconds of an inch. And if you suspect an impression is a certain depth, um, you may be able to just gently place that in until you see it touch the bottom, and this is just touching. You estimate it first visually, and then set it at what you think. You put it in, set it a little bit higher, and when you go down to the bottom, if that's not quite touching, you knock off a 32nd of an inch, down to 9, and you go down and it's just touching, so you can make a note, 9 32nds of an inch. You seize a tire a week later, 
take a tread depth, it's the right pattern in it. Take a tread depth reading, it happens to be 3 30 seconds of an inch, you know it can't be the tire. Because at the scene, it was 9 30 seconds of an inch. Now you're not going to catch that in a photograph. You're going to catch it in a plaster cast. If it's a good cast, you'll probably be able to measure the tread depth right off the cast, get 9 30 seconds. 8.30 seconds here, okay, that's so close. Yeah. Now, if the crime scene impression is um, 9.30 seconds and your suspect tire is, is 12.30 seconds, it may have been that tire. If the soil's kind of hard, it didn't sink in far enough, but what happened? So, you know, it's just one more little thing to look for comparison, and it may be a value to help you rule out a tire or what have you. So that's why I mentioned I think it's useful. You may also... Uh, that, oh, that's something else, uh, another factor. So there, there may be other um, areas that, that you can think of, but I think those are the major ones. And I've got a lot of this stuff listed. It doesn't hurt to make little notes of some of the things that's in it. I've got a lot of this stuff listed in the articles that I've handed out to you. Talk a little bit about this. Uh, this is the type of thing that I'm just going to describe. We're going to, the first exercise we're going to do is going to be with snow tires, uh, snow tires and snow impressions, which you don't get a whole lot of down here. <laughs> but the principle is the same as uh, in dirt, basically. Well, let's say we've got a crime scene impression that looks like that. Okay. Impression uh, in sand. A lot of the details lost, like the sipes and that, because of the quality of the sand, the quality of the snow, it just doesn't show up. Now, if you get a suspect vehicle and you take a test impression off the tire, and you look at those two, they're pretty darn close when you're working with eight by ten photographs. You might say, yes, this is consistent. Okay? You got another vehicle, similar design. You say yes. Well, it could be that one too. Okay, so let's say this is the suspect tire that you first got when you made this comparison. The point I'm making is to look at an impression like this, look at a tire. Yes, you can say it's similar, but it's very, very difficult to say. It's it, it's definitely the same design with the same pitch sequence. And it's difficult to say that it's the same size. It could, it could be wrong. Okay? And sometimes when we're not making positive identifications, we let our guard down a bit. You know, we say, well, I'm not saying it's positively the tire. It could have been any other tire with the same design. You know. But the point is, what if it couldn't have been that tire? You've incriminated the person. And the court puts a lot of weight sometimes, some jurors, on evidence that's not positive. Just because they say, well, it was his type of tire. You know, they put a lot of weight on that, unnecessarily maybe. Um, so the safe way to do it, I'll just show you another impression here. Just to confuse things. Let's say they got three vehicles, all with similar tires. You know, it's a common tire pattern, and they do enough work and it's a big enough case, you may get three vehicles with the same type of tire, and you're trying to figure out which one of those three could have made impression number two. And that's what we're going to do first thing this afternoon. We're going to work one-to-one -one with transparencies, and I don't think you're going to have any problem in being able to tell which one of these three impressions could have made number two, or which of these three tires would have made this impression. Which of these three made this one, and which of these three made this one? So that's the exercise we do, working one to one, using uh, noise treatment. Okay. So that's the exercise we do this afternoon, and go a little more into this business of uh, models and what have you. Okay. Some of the drawings that you get, they describe a pitch sequence, 
and other drawings describing model sequence. Okay? So sometimes all you do is you'll get a wheel with, a, with the pitch sequence on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or large, medium, uh, small, medium, large, what have you. That would be the pitch sequence with a bunch of numbers going around or a bunch of letters going around the wheel. Sometimes you'll get a model drawn. It'll, it'll show you what the model looks like and what the pitch sequence is in the model, which is a section of the car of the plastic. Now, let's just take an example where you have model A and a model B. Okay? Model A has a pitch sequence. Okay? Let's say there's five pitches. I'll tell you that model A has five. There's five pitches we use. Model A has three, two fives, two fours, and a three. Okay? That's uh, what size pitches we use to make model A. Model B, we use three, two twos, two ones, and a three. Okay? Now, if we put these models together, you see we've got two fives, two fours, two threes, two twos, two ones. And then we bring model A over here. We've got two threes, two fives, and off and half. And just link the models together. So this is what you get. Model B, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, A, A. That's a uh, sequence from the tire. Notice they put two Bs together, two As together. I couldn't tell you why, but they did that. It, it, I know that the reason was for noise treatment, and that's and maybe cost and uh, factors like that. You take all these models and you wrap them around in a circle, and you got a tire. You see, they all fit together. These two A's match up. The so that's that's what it looks like. Now, just want to give you an example of something else. Um, Let's just say that they're designing a tire. And they use a pitch sequence of two ones. Okay. And then I'll put in a three, six. See how they're getting larger when they have different ones? And then three. And let's see. Get five, one, two fours. We're actually building a pit sequence here for a tire. Two and a five, seven and a five. So this got eight pit sequence, eight pit sequences in it. We have an eight. Weights and put four and five. So you can get a real scrambled arrangement like that. Just to give you an example. Okay, so this is a sort of a scrambled pitch sequence where there isn't any repeating pattern. There's no two places on the tire. This one's repeating. I mean, the small A model B keeps repeating. This one doesn't. This is expensive, but nevertheless, it happens. And let me just give you an idea. Let's say this is our crime scene impression here, okay? And unbeknownst to us, in that crime scene impression is a pit sequence. Six, three, five, one, double <coughs> four, two, five, seven, five. But we don't know that, but it's in there. So this is uh, this represents all the lines in the pit sequence. So now this is all we're doing. We're just sliding this along like this. These lines come along, see if we can find a spot. And right there, see the lines all match up with the pit sequences. Yeah, a little bit one there, and things don't line up. See where this line is right in, in the middle of the floor? Move it back there. That's oops. <laughs> the wrong spot. Right, right there. There it is. Okay. Sometimes when you get close, it comes close to fitting. It's getting a little bit, and then all of a sudden, bang, you're right on. And other times, you're right next to it, and it's right out of whack. You move it one, slide it down one element, and it fits. And now you see it as I slide along. That's basically what we're doing. Okay? So we this pit sequence. So it's not all that mysterious a thing. I cut these out and just to demonstrate how to put these pit sequences together. 
Excuse me. If I understand yeah. you correctly that usually they're made with models, but expense, some expensive tires are made without a model? They just no. have one sequence? No, they all have models. Okay. Even a sequence like this, this could be a model. Okay? Two ones, three, six, uh, that would be one model. One, two, three, four. Okay, and then this would be another model. This would be another model. Okay? It might take ten models to do one side of the tire, and ten more to do the opposite side. So I might have twenty models. I've got a drawing here. They're all different, though. Yeah, they're all different. They all have a different pit sequence. So it could be model A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I think we've got a drawing that we'll look at tomorrow. It has about that many models in it. So there's a whole bunch of models, and you just won't find two places. So each model has its own pit sequence. It's cheaper if they just make two models and uh, just keep reproducing those. It gets a little more expensive the more models they have. The foundry has to make it up. Um, I want to show you um, a case from Vancouver, and then I'm going to show you um, some rare slides, I call them. The tire industry is very protective about what they will release for information because they spend millions of dollars and they're in competition with other tire manufacturers. So it's hard to get photographs and slides and that from the inside of factories. And uh, I've had several tours of tire plants, but I've never been able to take any photographs. Um, but I do have an excellent video that I'll show you from Firestone. How many have seen from the milk of the tree? Anybody? Okay, this is a great video for those that have never been to a tire factory because it's from start to finish and it's really good. Very interesting. There's stuff on there that you can never get a photograph of, but yet they'll put it in the video. Now I got, some, I got special permission from them. They, they gave me a copy of this video. Okay? I can't give you permission to copy it. Okay? Because I don't have permission from them. But they did provide it to me for training purposes. They use it to their own people for training. And uh, there's no big secrets in there that anybody's going to get out of. Mean, the tire industry, they're all watching each other. They cut each other's tires up. They evaluate each other. They're, they're watching each other very closely. So they have very few uh, secrets, but they do have some highly technical things, but not something that anyone can pick up in this video. But it's really interesting. Um, so I'll show you that. Also, I got some slides from um, the General Tire Company on how a foundry makes a tire mold. And it's, it, there's, once again, there's no secrets in there. But until you see something like that, this model business, it all sounds a little bit kind of foreign. But once you see things, it, it, it all sort of starts to make a bit of sense. So what you're going to see is you're going to see how they make the model. It's just like we make a plaster cast or footprint or a tire cap. They just uh, have their little casting, and they pour the devil stone and get the model, fit them all together. That's all it is. But you'll see how they put these models together. And first, I want to show you a case um, that Goodyear helped us out on uh, Vancouver Police Department. And it sort of emphasizes how uh, noise treatment can aid us in our comparison process. Even though the tire companies are somewhat reluctant give mold drawings out, they are usually always very helpful to the extent that they are able to be without having to get permission to release things. Um, in this case, uh, the people at Goodyear helped me and uh, I had to just, you know, like agree that this was stuff that I wouldn't release to other people and that I wouldn't make tires from these drawings and everything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't retire and go into the tire business. Uh, this is a crime scene photograph in mud. Okay, this was a photograph taken in a murder scene in British Columbia. This is a cast taken from the same impression. The cast is, even the photograph of the cast is better to work with. Because you get rid of the shadows. You can control the lighting on this. I sent this photograph to Goodyear in Toronto. The, the, the photograph that I got originally was to identify the pattern. Now, this pattern was not in the tread design guidebook because all patterns aren't in there. 
but I recognized this pattern because I had had the same tire pattern at a crime scene myself in Saskatchewan. I went to some tire shops and I found a tire with that design on Canadian Tire. It's a big retailer of tires for the resale market in Canada. And that was one of their patterns. So I sent it off to Goodyear because I read the serial number and it told me that it was made by Goodyear. And they said, well, we looked at your cast and they marked it for me. They said, we can see that you've got a pitch sequence in there. A large, small, two mediums, a small and a large. And that wasn't too hard to see. Whoops. Better put that somewhere a little bit safer. Heavy duty flash. Okay, once they pointed out, it was pretty easy to see. They drew the lines. And I can see these lugs. Yeah, those lugs there, they look big. These ones look small, and these ones are kind of in between. Take your pair of dividers, put it right on there, and you can see. Oh, got to shrink that one down, and this one got expanded. So they could actually see the pit sequence for me, and they knew from their records that only two sides of the fire had that pit sequence. So they sent me this drawing. And this is a drawing of uh, what the pitch sequence is looking like, the design drawing. And here's a little wheel down here. The little wheel's got large, medium, small, etc. going around it. So it shows what order the pitch sequences are. So they sent me a drawing from each of the tires. They sent me a letter. So here's the other tire, the other drawing. Same pitch sequence. Two different sizes of tires. They said, um, we fully agree with your identification of the tread design, and by measuring the width of the shoulder lugs, for comparison purposes, it has been established that the pitch sequence of your plaster cast is large, small, medium, medium, small, large. Our company produced these tires in 12 sizes, but of these, only two sizes contain the above sequence, the P19575R14 and the P22575R14. 12 sizes, but only two have that pitch sequence. They could tell that just from looking at a photograph of the cast. Mm -hmm. Yes? How long did it take you to get a response? Um, not too long uh, in that case. I think it was about three weeks. But you could wait longer in some cases. But if it's urgent, the best thing to do is send a letter, do up an official letter, send it, and then give them a call and ask them if they received your letter. And they might even agree to work with you over the phone. You can fax stuff to them. They're pretty good like that. They said, in this size design, we produced this tire, Sieberling All Season, Kelly Springfield Navigator, Canadian Tire Season Master, Canadian Tire Season Master Mark II, the Monarch Steel, and the Dunlop Gold Cup. So what they had was a mold which was generic, and they took screws out of the sidewall plates in the mold and removed the sidewall plate put the name Dunlop in, and screwed it in, and made it several thousand tires. Then they took it out, put the Canadian tire sidewall plate in. So they used the same mold to make tires for, for <coughs> six, six or so different companies. So very important thing that we could do there was tell the investigator, you were looking for only two sizes of tires. This tire is seized in another size other than these two. It's not the right tire. Don't make the mistake of saying it could have been that tire. Secondly, they knew the names they had to look at. So they, and third, they sent us a photograph of the tire and said, this is what the tire looks like. That's a lot better for the investigator to look for. He's got a name, he's got a picture now, and the, uh, the specialist, the crime lab specialist, or the ident specialist knows what size it's got to be. So you can tell the investigator that too. So pit sequence here was really helpful. Well, you yes. Also, what? I'm sorry, you also had to know which manufacturer it was. Yes, and I got that from the serial number on the side of the tire. Okay. I'll show you that in a second. They also sent me a chunk of the tire. And they ground down half of the chunk. If you look at the photograph, the outside rib has the sipes worn down, about 50%. See, <laughs> so here's what the new sipes should look like. And the sipes worn down 50% like that. That's what they're like in the plaster cast. So there was quite a bit of sidewall wear. I mean, not sidewall, but outer rib wear. Excuse me. 
on the sipes. So, you know, you can really eliminate a lot of tires with, with that plastic cast. They ground that down basically to match the photograph? No, this just happened to be a sample that they had. The guy said, I've got a sample here. I talked to him on the phone, and he said, just happened to have one of your tire, mm -hmm. and it's ground down part way, just for us to look at, you know, what it's like. And he says, I'm going to send it along to you. I said, okay, <laughs> great, I can use it for training. Um, but tire companies will sometimes uh, computer generate about four images of the tread pattern for you that show you what the tire sites look like. New, 75%, 50%, 25%. Ernest Ham in Florida had a case not too long ago where the people at uh, General Tires, I believe, in, in the U.S. were good enough to send him four generated computer drawings. I haven't seen him yet. He's going to send me a copy of month. But I talked to the people at Cooper Tires, and they said, yeah, they have stuff like that. So that's an option. All you can do is ask. And if they say no, you can fine. But some of, some of the people, uh, they're not releasing any big secrets. They get the approval of their supervisor, and they're able to send you something that's very helpful. So I'll send this around. You can see what I'm talking about, sightware, how much they change. Have you had any experience with uh, any of the Japanese companies? Um, not really, no. Like, I sent a request away to uh, Bridgestone and didn't get any reply back. Now, Bridgestone owns Firestone now. They probably wear that. They bought Firestone out. And, and um, there was a takeover bid on Goodyear that didn't succeed. So I'm happy that Goodyear is owned by Goodyear and that it didn't start being split up or divided. It's a great company with quite a tradition in history. And also, I like to see the tire industry stabilized so that I can get my contacts and not get bruised. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Conti bought out, I think they bought out General, and uh, Michelin owns, uh, they bought out, uh, what's Unero Goodrich? I mean, it's, yeah, Michelin bought out Unero Goodrich. It's really getting confusing the last five years in the global tire industry. Takeover bids on everybody, and uh, the dust is kind of clearing now. Yeah, we have a lot of Japanese tires in Southern California. Yes, yeah. But they use exactly the same principles we're talking about here. Their technology is based on research done by the American tire manufacturers and the Europeans. Yes? Only Goodyear people would have known or been able to easily pick out the... That's right. the uh, pitch pattern on that, right? Otherwise, it's pretty difficult to see anything. That's right. How but can you know? see the size of those lights changing now that you know? Yeah. You can see yeah. them changing. It's just that it's like Only there, they, there's a single lug, and then there's an upside down yeah. U, and a single lug, and upside down U. You wouldn't know, yeah. looking at it, whether to go from one single to the next as a pitch, or to yeah. skip one. And Only Goodyear would have been able to do that. Yeah. I mean, if I sent that to Firestone, they might have been able to tell me it was a Goodyear tire. Maybe. But they wouldn't have been able to nail that pitch sequence. I don't think I would have got that. I just happened to probably get some guys that recognized the tire, maybe even worked on it. See, that tire was made in Valley Field, Quebec. Mm -hmm. here's, here's a little bit of information on that tire, okay? There is one small pitch sequence. That's what it looks like. A pitch sequence is a small portion of the tread. From one point to another. From this point, or a little peak on that, to this point. And that's how much of the design, you see some of it's cropped out, but that's how much of the design is contained within that one, one pitch sequence. That's where the 225 75R14 or the 195-75R14. For the two sizes. The other, the other 10 sizes are going to have a bit of a different scenario. Now, let's take a look at how many pitch sequences they use for those two sizes of tires, for these two sizes right here. Okay. They use nine small, everybody see that? They use nine small, ten medium, and nine large for those two sizes of tires. So you can see that the 
the small pit sequence, the design is somewhat compressed, and then for the medium pit sequence, everything gets like stretched out, and then for the wire, it's stretched out further. You'll see that in the video that's coming up shortly. You'll see it on the computer screen, pushing buttons. You'll see the elements getting larger and smaller. The computer can do that simulator. So tires are designed on computers today. Now, let's see what uh, the pitch sequence would be arranged like. We know that there's 28 pitches for these two sizes of tires, but how do they arrange those 28 pitches? This is how they arrange them. Right there. Okay, so going around the tire, <coughs> let's start right here. Small, large, medium, large, small, medium, and so on. All the way around on the outside edge of the tire. Two mediums right here. That's what you see in the cast, two mediums. So not only will the investigator or the uh, specialist doing the comparison know that it's got to be one of these two sizes of tires, he will also know that this is the only place on the tire that he has to look, or in the test impression. Forget about cuts that look like they're the correct ones that are down in this area or over here. If there's any cuts that are attributed to the same cause, they're going to have to fall in this area here. On, this, on the two mediums, large, small, two mediums, small. Large. That's, that's if you know um, inside or outside. Yeah, right. inside or outside, right. Because does your diagram show a whole different set of pitch sequences for the inside? Right here, there's the pitch sequence for the inside, right there, and it has two mediums as well. So it could fit, if you turned it around, you're right, it could fit on the inside too, possibly. Is it the same sequence, just offset? Okay. Yeah, looks like it is. Medium, medium, small, large, medium, small, large, medium, large. See? Looks like it's just offset. Okay? So it's the same pitch sequence, just twisted a bit. A couple of pitches. Uh, whether you reverse this and you're going to be able to get it to fit or not, I'm not sure. I, I didn't try. It hasn't been tried. Um, I just wanted to mention that the outside edge of the tire is the female half of the mold. That's why it says male half and female half. The inside edge of the tire is the male half. Anybody guess why? Now, the feet, there's dowel pins. Okay, There's pins and there's holes that they fit in oh. the top and bottom half. That's so that, that the mold can be locked together in the right position so that the, you know, the the, the offset isn't improper. That mold's got to fit together so that the, the design, the pitch sequences are lined up exactly the way it was designed. So there's dowel pins that fit in. The female half of the mold is the top half, and the top half is the, is the outside edge of the tire. Now the top half doesn't have debris and stuff falling into it, little bits of, uh, you know, tiny bits of rubber, something that might fall in. If that falls, it's going to fall on the bottom half of the mold and cause little impurities or something, maybe cosmetic problems. That will be on the inside of the tire. At least it won't be on the outside where it shows. So that's what the engineers, that's why they told me that the uh, top half of the mold is usually always the outside edge of the tire. So when you get the drawings from the manufacturers, it says female half, male half. That's what that's the way it's, it's labeled on the drawings. So there could be some accidental things that would be on the inside edge of your tire. On the sidewall? On the sidewall. Oh, yeah. sidewall, right. Yeah. Right. Apparently there could be a little, little blemishes or something like that. I didn't notice that being a big problem when I went to my tours. And, but I, I get, that's the, the reason behind it, I'm told. Anyway. Now, any questions on that? So that's pitch sequence for this particular tire. The other 10 sizes are going to have different pitch sequences. Maybe they won't have two mediums together at all. You know, like they might have two smalls or two large or whatever the case may be. Now, I think uh, it's a good time to show those. Uh, I'm going to have to set that up so I can turn the lights on. I want to show you how they make mold very quickly, and then we'll show the video. All right. 
this is a rubber tooling, and th this is a mold uh, boundary. They're going to make a mold, and they've received a plaster model from the tire company, such as Goodyear or Firestone, whatever the company would be. And from that master model, the one that they guard and protect, it's the one they get that's their master, they make a rubber tooling. In other words, this is a cast made from the other one. So it's a negative of the positive cast they got from the factory. This rubber tooling here has the design in it. And they can use this about uh, 30 times, 25 to 30 times, and then it gets distorted a little bit, and they have to make a new one. So they go back to the master, make another casting one. He's taking little blades out of here, little sight blades, for this particular design of tire, and he's inserting them into little slots in the rubber tool. Okay? And those are what's going to make the little slits in the tire. Okay, now he's putting, can you adjust the focus a little bit on it? I don't know if it's out of the camera turn. Ah, uh, yes. A little bit back. The other way. Right there, that's perfect. He's putting it in a core box. So this rubber tooling goes in a core box. Mix up some high quality casting material, very similar to dental stone. Pour it into the core box. The rubber tooling's inside there. Pop out the plaster cast in about 20 minutes. This is a model, a plaster model for the noise treatment, whatever that noise treatment might be for the design drawings they got. Now he's going to clean it up, fine tune it, but there's the plaster model one section of the circumference, and there's the sight blades in it. Those little blades are going to make the little slits in the elements. Now, they make up the required number of models. Maybe there's 10 or so. Fit them all together. And where there's a seam, where two models meet, sight blades missing, they add it. Now they're doing measurements to make sure that the model is exactly as per requirements from the drawings. Then they take this plaster tire, let's call it, or a dental stone tire, put it on a table and drop a coat over it. So there's the, there's the plaster models all fit together. This is a casting that fits over top of it called a coat. It's got risers on it. They bring over the molten aluminum alloy and pour it into one of the risers. The alloy will flow entirely around the cast and rise into these tubes, and as it cools, these will feed the casting. The sludge and impurities will float to the top. They let it harden for the required amount of time. They pull this off, and the plaster mainly breaks up. They take a high-pressure jet hose, spray that, and clean it all off. And this is what they get. This is a mold ring for a full circle mold, top and bottom half. This is a segmented mold. It's got the top and bottom half all in one piece, and the seams run this way, you see? Those are the seams there that are going to be cut. So this one's going to separate at right angles, and this one's going to pull it. And I have another one. As a matter of fact, you can just take this, another one made just like that, and flip it upside down and put it on top of that. You've got your full one, and that's off and how it's done. So this is cheaper. This costs $20,000 to make a mold this way. It costs $40,000 approximately to make a mold that way. That would be Canadian funds, I think, but probably pretty close to the US. This is just the, some of the finishing that does, is done on molds, uh, just to demonstrate how um, you know, precision this process is and, and what lengths they go to to make each mold exactly the same and to get any little flaws out any necks, it's inspected very carefully. The back is all machined off, so it's got the right contours. And this is sort of like a finished mold ring now. And then they stretch it. The circumference of that mold is out just thousands of an inch. They'll stretch it a little bit to get it exactly for what the manufacturer said he wanted it. It's got to fit in this mold back exactly. This is a mold back which is going to be machined out. 
engineers are partly machined, pretty well finished. A little piece of the moldering is fit in to make sure the contour is just right. Now they're going to drill holes in it so that they can bolt the, the moldering in, into it. Moldering slips down inside and all these little bolts will be tightened. Tighten them there. The uh, engraving on the sidewall, the sidewall plate might be removable or it might actually be part of the mold ring itself, depending on whether it's a generic design or, you know, like a flag tire of the company, like the Goodyear um, Eagle GT Plus 4, for example. The sidewall and the mold ring would all be one unit. <coughs> um, this can be done by punching or you know, laser controlled engraving machines or what have you. This is just you know, fine tuning to make sure the lettering is perfect. Right measurements. Inspection here. Make sure that everything's correct. And that's basically the finishing process. Another inspection. Devices, measuring devices to make sure that uh, the diameter, room depths, sites are all proper. We put the two halves together and finally inspect it again. And now this is going to be shipped off to a tire plant that we're going to see in the video coming up. And that's what's going to make the vulcanized tread design on the tire. So that's basically it. Okay, we'll turn the lights on. We're going to have a five minute stretch break and everything. When you come back, we'll have a video radio, radio to show you. Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, he found an alien culture of mysterious architecture, strange religions, and even new technologies, then unknown to the so-called civilized world. One of these technologies involved a remarkably stretchy, springy substance, which the people made, they said, from the milk of a tree.
Solid rubber tires were an early answer, but not a very good one. They rode hard. Their speed had to be limited to 15 miles per hour. And they were incredibly difficult to build, especially to achieve reliable adhesion to the metal rim. It was the invention of the pneumatic tire that made all the difference. And passenger cars became more than a curiosity. The tread is the tough, thick, wear-resistant layer of rubber 
in contact with the road. It has a complex pattern molded into its surface to provide maximum traction. Just underneath the tread of a radial tire are the belt flies, which give the tire structural stability and contribute to the superior handling and excellent fuel economy, which are characteristic of radial tires. Flex-resistant sidewall rubber, sometimes with a decorative stripe, covers and protects the cords. Because noise and traction characteristics are an important part of the specification for our new tire, a great deal of attention is being paid to its tread design. This engineer can not only see what his design might look like, he can actually test its noise performance by calling up a graph of the sound pattern the tread might be expected to produce when running on the road. Then, by asking the computer to search for the best combination of design elements, he can watch the improvement in expected results on the same screen. And in this research facility, a sound synthesizer permits designers to actually hear what the tire might sound like when driven at various speeds. But before a mold for the tire is ever fabricated, Engineers will have a sample of a tire with the intended tread carved into the rubber surface of an experimental tire in a prototype laboratory. This accurate prototype sculpture will be used for styling studies as well as for actual vehicle testing. In this anechoic chamber, an echoless sound laboratory, Engineers can evaluate tread noise performance in the real world and compare it with the computer's predictions. <coughs> Before the new design is released to production, completely assembled experimental tires will be built to the new specification on factory equipment. These prototypes will be thoroughly tested for all of the criteria that will be factors in the tire's performance. Factors like how the tire will ride, which is a function of its spring rate or stiffness. Rolling resistance of a new tire at its rate of load is also measured, since this property has a significant effect on fuel economy. How the tire will affect handling of the vehicle is determined by evaluating cornering forces against the roadbed on a test machine that can control the so-called slip angle while the tire is operating. Durability tests are run at much higher than normal highway speeds, sometimes over 100 miles an hour, under loads which exceed any they are likely to encounter in service. But in the final analysis, the tire must be tested on actual vehicles in the real world. At its 6,000-acre test center near Fort Stockton, Texas, and at similar facilities in Europe. Firestone subjects its prototype tires to a broad spectrum of tests. Traction is evaluated during braking tests by locking up the wheel on dry pavement. A similar test is performed on wet road surfaces. This test is designed to measure any tendency of the tire to hydroplane when a layer of water covers the pavement. And the ultimate in handling on wet roads is evaluated in this lateral skid test. The new tread pattern does a good job. The test vehicle is stable in the turn. It does not spin out. In preparation for a wet test of another kind, this tire is being notched. The tread is cut away locally, and the rubber is ground off to expose bare steel belt fly cords. Then, as part of a long-term durability test program, the notched tires periodically pass through a bath of concentrated salt brine to test the adhesion of the steel cords in the belt flies to the rubber tread.
under severely corrosive conditions. are part of the test program. Cobblestone set in concrete. Washboard gravel roads. To study how roads like these can affect vehicle ride, the road surface can actually be recorded on tape and then played back in the laboratory on a road simulator, permitting engineers to study vehicle tire combinations that have never been to the proving ground. Fort Stockton's eight-mile closed oval track is designed to accommodate the very high speeds modern passenger cars and other highway vehicles are capable of attaining. The tires are required to withstand thousands of miles of running at velocities substantially in excess of any they are ever likely to see on public highways. periodically examined. At regular intervals, they are visually inspected, physically measured, and they may also be subjected to a non-destructive laser holography probe to study interior stress variables. Accumulated in computer data banks, the resulting data is shared with the company's research and development centers throughout the world. Duplicating test track conditions in a laboratory a thousand miles away using a thermal vision camera, research scientists can monitor the temperature of tire components under high speed conditions by studying the colors on the screen. The new tire looks good in every respect. After commercial testing in both urban and highway service, it will be put into production and the new tire will become a part of the product line. The production process begins thousands of miles from most tire factories in the African nation of Liberia, in the Far East, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. For natural rubber is still used in some tire components, coagulated from latex, the milk of the rubber tree. Unlike sap, which flows through the wood of a tree, latex occurs between layers of bark. Occurring in only a few plants and trees, is a unique material whose natural function is not yet fully understood by botanical science. For more than half a century, rubber trees have been cultivated on plantations where product quality can be controlled. Firestone pioneered in the establishment of rubber plantations beginning in 1925. But most of the rubber used in today's tires comes from petrochemical complexes like this one. Here, synthetic rubbers called elastomers are chemically tailored to meet the demanding needs of modern radial tire components. Some tire compounds contain blends of both natural and synthetic rubbers. In the tire factory where our radial tire will be produced, bales of synthetic rubber and natural rubber are weighed onto a feed belt conveyor in the compound room. This tire tread compound is a blend of both natural and synthetic elastomers. Other compounding ingredients are pre-weighed before placing on the conveyor belt for a final weigh. During the first mixing stage, these additives include plasticizers and reinforcing agents such as carbon black, which lends both strength and abrasion resistance. Chemical curatives will be added in a second mixing stage as the master batch is used. Both mixing stages take place in a three-story machine called a Banbury mixer, whose steel rotors are driven by a 4,000 horsepower motor to break down and blend the nervy bales of rubber 
will be other materials in the specified formulation. Some 10 different compounds are required for the various components in a tire, each developed for its own unique combination of flexibility, toughness, and durability. The compounded rubber stock is conveyed to the steel rolls of a rubber mill, where it is further worked and blended into a smooth, even sheet. The mill room is one of many quality control checkpoints in the manufacturing process. A sample from every Banbury batch is checked for physical properties in the mill room control laboratory before the batch is released to production. Specific gravity, for example, is verified by dropping a small piece of the mixed rubber into liquids of calibrated density. The sample must float in the first one and sink in the second. Meanwhile, rate of vulcanization or cure is checked on another piece of equipment. When simultaneously heated and twisted in an instrument called a rheometer, the stiffness of the rubber compound must increase at a specified rate as it begins to cure, as plotted on this chart. Before any materials are ever sent to stock mixing, samples have been checked in the analytical laboratory. Here, a test batch of newly received rubber is mixed on a laboratory mill with sulfur, accelerators, and other vulcanizing and reinforcing chemicals. After it is molded into laboratory slabs and cured in a heated press, the rubber is checked for tensile strength, elongation, and other physical properties. Each approved batch of mixed rubber stock is used to fabricate a specific tire component. Several of these are made on a four-roll calendar, as this machine is called. The heated precision ground steel rolls of a calendar may be used to produce the thin sheet of non-reinforced pure gum rubber of the tire inner liner, for example. Or the calendar may serve as an applicator to coat the pre-dipped polyester cords that will become the body ply of a radial tire. The multi-strand steel cords of the stabilizer flies, brass plated to achieve chemical adhesion to rubber, travel directly from their spools in the temperature and humidity controlled creel room into the bite of the calendar rolls. Each cord individually aligned and precisely tensioned to achieve a uniform flat sheet of structural tire building material. An electronic scanner linked to a computer monitors and automatically controls the thickness and width of the sheet. The computer's digital and graphic display allows a continuous quality control check during the calendaring operation. To make the stabilizer or felt plies for radial tires, the calendared steel cords are cut on the bias at a precisely controlled angle held to a fraction of a degree and automatically spliced back together to form a continuous band. The double width felt fly is split in two and wound up for tire building. Meanwhile, the rubber-coated polyester body flies are made in a similar manner, cut at right angles to the proper width and spliced back together with the cords running straight across the fabric. Extrusion is another basic rubber process. White side walls are made as a co-extrusion of white and black rubber stocks forced through a heated steel die to shape the composite product. To protect the band of white stock during processing, it is covered with a thin layer of black stock to be ground off later. Then the hot extrusion is cooled to prevent premature vulcanization before it is packaged for tire building. Tire beads are also made by an extrusion process. 
Individual strands of brass-plated steel wire are gathered together as they pass through the extrusion die, which also surrounds them with an insulating coat of rubber and forms the assembly into a band. The continuous band of rubberized steel is wound on itself, forming strong, uniform, rubberized hoops four to six layers thick. In the initial stage of radio tire assembly, beads are the first components that are put into place on the tire building machine. At each end of the building drum on which the radio tire will be assembled, the beads are what holds the tire on the wheel. The operator then applies a non-reinforced layer of a synthetic rubber having very low permeability to air. This pure gum layer will form the inner liner of the finished tire. Next, the operator wraps on the body fly with its reinforcing polyester cords having the strength necessary to contain the tire's air pressure. as we saw earlier in the cross-section. After rollers beneath the drum iron the flies together, the cords of the body fly are turned up to wrap around the beads and are ironed down by automatic rollers. Guide lights projected onto the building drum from a bank of overhead projectors assist the operator in precisely locating each sidewall strip, an extrusion comprised of a stripe of white rubber encapsulated in the black sidewall section. After cutting to length, the operator carefully splices the sidewall strips, matching white rubber to white, black to black. To assure a good bond, the splices are firmly knitted together or stitched with a pressure roller. He applies a permanent carcass identification label and his builder's number. Automatic rollers stitch the entire carcass together, completing the first stage assembly of the radio tire. The uncured carcasses are stored on end to prevent distortion of their circular shape, and they are conveyed to second stage assembly by a driverless robot tractor. Meanwhile, the tire tread has been manufactured on a multi-story automated extrusion line, longer than a football field. Extruded from its steel die, the tread is permanently identified by a kind of king-sized dot printer before moving on to second stage tire building. Here, the tire builder begins by wrapping the first of two steel stabilizer flies on his band building chuck. The steel cords run at a precisely controlled angle. These belt flies will be right under the tread in the finished tire. The builder is assisted by guide lights as he places the second stabilizer ply with its steel cords intersecting at an angle opposite to that of the first ply. A heat lamp warms the cut ends of the tread section to make them tacky just before the operator rolls the tread onto the stabilizer flies and splices it together. The warm splice is stitched down to assure a firm, cohesive bond. The building chuck then swings into a grab arm whose mechanical fingers remove the band assembly. Meanwhile, the operator has mounted the carcass from first stage assembly on an expansion mandrel where he adds his own identification numbers and inflates the carcass to receive the band assembly from the grab arm. Automatic 
movers move in to stitch the tread over the side walls and to knit all of the components together. This completes the assembly of the so-called green tire, which is now ready for curing. Curing takes place in dual cavity vulcanization presses that function something like giant waffle irons. After the operator places the green tire on a loading holder, it is automatically transferred into the press. Each tire is centered over an inflatable bladder inside the heated tire mold. The interior of the mold contains the tread pattern as well as all sidewall identification and aesthetics. As the press closes, the inflatable bladder expands in a program sequence with internal hot water pressure of several hundred pounds per square inch, pressing the tire into the hot mold while also supplying internal heat. Typically, in less than 16 minutes, at temperatures peaking well over 300 degrees, the press automatically opens. Both the curing time and step temperature cycle for the presses is computer monitored. Behind the row of presses, the cured tires are conveyed to finishing and final inspection. After 100% manual inspection to pick up any irregularities or cosmetic defects, the finished product is transported to the Tire Uniformity Optimizer Module. Here, the protective black rubber coating is ground off the white sidewall, and every tire is inflated and subjected to a computer control operation which optimizes its roundness and uniformity, while simultaneously inspecting the sidewalls. Random samples from final inspection are subjected to X-ray examination. Other sample tires, selected from production on a statistical quality control basis, are checked at the factory on a high-speed performance dynamometer to verify that their durability is up to established standards. But the ultimate proof of all tires is on the world's highways, where the mileage on modern radials is often a hundred times better than the life attained by many tires of only a few years ago. Indeed, tire technology has made more progress in the present century than since Columbus discovered rubber in the New World. Questions from uh, what we okay. covered there? Pretty well a review of some of the stuff we did this morning. Are uh, all of the pets is that uh, manual labor oriented? Or? Yeah, most of them are. They're, they're trying to um, develop equipment that cuts down the amount of labor in the tire assembly, but uh, I think it's pretty well all. All the clients are pretty well, very close to that. Now, any of the ones I've been in, that's the way it's been done. But I've read some articles recently where Michelin is talking about opening the plant very soon that will have some of that tire assembly of the components done by machines. But it's such a, um, an important part of the manufacturing process. It has to be done so precisely that uh, right now, humans are the best way of doing it to make sure that all those parts are properly assembled and put on just so. Because if you get machines going a little bit wrong, they can make a lot of tires that aren't any good before you find out. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the things that uh, they're doing. Because they are looking into that. So no questions on that. It's just about lunch time. Can we, uh, Taken a look at a lot of things this morning with relating with, that relate to um, tire examination and comparison. 
and uh, some of the points that we went over, and uh, some of the things that I stress are important, I think, that when you're doing a comparison and arriving at an opinion. And this is a little overhead that uh, talks a little bit about that. I don't know how well we can see this, but it's a statement that I uh, says, if the law has made you a witness, remain a man or a woman of science. You have no victim to avenge, no guilty or innocent person to ruin or save. You must bear witness within the limits of science. And the person that said that was Paul C. Broadell, Chairman of Forensic Medicine, Sorbonne, 1897. And I think that says a lot about what we have to do today when we're doing uh, comparisons. We have to look very carefully at the evidence. We have to analyze it, evaluate it, and then give our opinion, our unbiased opinion of what our findings are. And the more little clues and the more you look into things carefully, such as doing one-to-one -one comparisons, uh, the more accurate your conclusions are. So I think that if, uh, if that's the case, uh, if we do that, our opinion is unbiased. It's not we, we shouldn't have any influence from the investigators or facts that we know surrounding the case. Whether the investigators tell you that they suspect this person strongly did it because of other evidence that has nothing to do whatsoever with the tire comparison. Your opinion, uh, the tire evidence, has to be solely based on what you recorded at the scene, what you can see, and what you can demonstrate to other people, what you can show other people. You're the only one that see certain accidental characteristics and your cohorts don't agree with you. You have to be concerned that uh, you're pilotted once. So just picking up that much extra on the impression, you know, in the crime scene, I was able to tell which of the two places this fit. Okay, the snow impression on the crime on the test impression that I took in the car, it only fit in one spot. But there were two places that were really close. And the only place they differed was right at the end here. If I had only had this much from there down, I wouldn't have been able to tell which. It would have fit in the two places. So just ha having picked up that little bit extra, I was able to tell which of the two. That's because uh, you know certain areas were, were repeating, but adjacent right to it was a little area that was different. So the two spots weren't exactly the same. And I never did get the uh, mold drawings for this particular one. Okay, so I guess we'll uh, try some hands-on. Break up into groups. I'll let you try a little bit of it yourself if you've never done any of these. Now, um, that's a typical pitch sequence for the super radio. Uh, that's what the engineers at Firestone called one pitch length. So if you look at your pattern, you know, just before this little break here to the middle of the next one, that's what they call one pitch length. Now, what did they do with those pitch lengths? They took um, see if we can get that all on the board there. They took three sizes, a large, a medium, and a small. Oops. This is uh, got the wrong one up there, just a second. Sometimes these get mixed up. Okay, we said the last one, uh, Firestone Town and Country Super Radio. Okay. I don't want to confuse you too much here. They, they did this one with two models. They took a Model A, and in the Model A, they got one, two, three, four, five. So they made five sizes of pitch lengths. So they had um, plaster model carved up just like that. Okay. 
Okay, went to the foundry. Then they did a Model B. What was the Model C? That was town and country. Is that what you were looking at on the thing? Well, you had there was a Model, model a, a and a Model C. C is the male. Oh, the other half. The other half down here. Sorry. Okay, so this is the A model and this is the C model. It has the same piss sequence, but it's on the other half, and it's not a. It's not. You can't just turn this around. Okay, this is like flopping it straight down that one. Okay, so they had to have a separate model for this. You see, this is kind of like a directional design. See how these things go in? Okay, so they had to do another model for the opposite side of the tire. They couldn't just flip this model A around and use it over again because this is going in and that's going in. But isn't that the whole tire? No, this is a portion of it. One, two, three, four, five, model A, model C. Okay. It's the whole width. I'm sorry. It's, it's the whole width. width. That's, that's the whole width. That's the whole width, right. right. Yeah. Um, well, model one A is one half, model C is the other half. That's of the right. Um, that's this the is the female or outside edge, model A, and then the male or inside edge would be model C. Okay. That's the whole width of, of this tire. Uh -huh. So that shows the outer and the inner. Right. So. Right. Outside. So this piece right here will be one model, model A. Oh, okay. And this piece right here will be model C. And it will have a pitch sequence, one, two, three, four, five, and this is one, two, three, four, five. Now, that's model A, model C, if we're looking at both sides of the tire. And this is uh, B and D. Okay, uh, model B, five, four, three, two, one. And then the other side of the tire, five, four, three, two, one, it's model D. Now, can I look at that and tell whether or not it's the, uh, the full circle mold or the segmented? No, not by just looking at that. Or just by looking at the tire? By looking at the tire, you might be able to tell. Yeah, not right. by looking at that, the impression. But by looking at C's tire, you might be able to see the seam going right around the circumference and tell what type of mold it is. But you can find that out just by calling the manufacturer if you want to. Okay, so those are the models, A, B, C, and D. And now here's, here's uh, the female half, okay? You won't worry about the other half, the male half. So. Let's just take a look at the outside edge. Model B, one, two, three, four, five. Then they put an A in. Five, four, three, two, one. And B, one, two, three, four, five. And an A, five, four, three, two, one. And so on. So model A, B, B, A, B, A, B, A. So this would be D, C, D, C, D, C, D, C for the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the pitch sequence. So you can see how the models all fit together and continue that pitch sequence. So that was the tire that you people worked on. And it fit four times. Yeah. No? One, two, three, four. Four times. If you only had a very short portion, about six inches long, could could possibly fit in here. One, two, three, four. It might be part of the A model you picked up. One, two, three, four. But if you pick up more, you, know, you can get a larger area. Fit there once, twice, three times, four times. Combinations of what you pick up. Now, let's take a look at the other one. Okay, try not to get these two mixed up here. So that was the this prior Stone Town and Country Super Radio. Now the see if I can get the other one here. Okay. This is uh, Firestone Town and Country Snow Biter, which is really a similar design used by Firestone. Now, this is the one that had a large, medium, and small, people knows. So instead of having five pitch, pitch lengths, they only had three, 
large, medium, and small. They had six large, 18 medium, and 12 small. So there was 36 units. They had, uh, in a full <coughs> one third of the circumference, they had two large, three medium, four small, and three medium again. And this is how they arranged it. This is a little wheel that came on the mold drawing. Four small, three medium, two large, three medium, four small, and so on, going all the way around. So that's the order that they're in. And this, this is the same order they're going to be in no matter what the size of the tire, whether it's a 13 to 14 to 15, it doesn't matter. All they did was just make these pitches a little bit larger for the larger size tire, but keep them in exactly the same order. So sometimes that's the case. And that was the same with the last tire we just looked at, one, two, three, four, five. Didn't matter what size, it was always the same pitch sequence. They just shrunk or reduced or enlarged depending on the size of the tire. So this is one third of the circumference, so this whole pattern will repeat three times. One, two, three. So your test impression fit in three places on one circumference there. So that's basically uh, what you were looking at when you were doing that test impression comparison with the uh, transparency. And even though you, you might not know what the pitch sequence was in your thing, you still found out where it fit. You still would have found out it fit in three places, regardless of whether I you saw this and I told you. If you did it carefully, it was you would have found it would have fit in three places, and you would have found out it fit in four. So what you would have deduced from that was that it's the same size, it's the same design. The tire must be the same size as the, or, or is consistent with being the same size if the uh, pitch sequence is matching. Furthermore, um, the design's matching because everything's old lane, you can see through it. And also, one of those three places must have made it, but you probably wouldn't be able to tell which of the three. Because the impression's not a good enough quality. You don't see the fine detail there. There isn't wear or any accidental characteristics to help you. So if you went to court, you'd have to say, well, it'll be one of those three. Well, which of those three spots? I can't tell which of the three. Or which of the four nineties? Yes. With this group here, um, mm -hmm. if you didn't know which direction it was going, would you be able to go uh, one way and have it match the other? Because it looks no, like the pitch sequences would would allow you for you to reverse it. Well, this particular one you can't reverse because you see these lugs are, are going oh. right. So if you turn it around, the lugs are pointing the wrong way. This is one tire that um, is only, you're only going to be able to search it one way. Now this particular tire, when you put it on your vehicle, when you put it on the right hand side, okay, let's say this is the tire on the right hand side, that's what it looks like, right? This is the outside edge. Put it on the other side of the vehicle, pattern runs differently in the snow. So you can, this tire can, no, you still get traction. This tire can run in either direction. Can be mounted either way and still work quite well. Okay, now if the white wall, let's say this is the pattern, and here's the white wall, okay, and that's the way it is, right? We turn that tire around, take it off the vehicle, put it on the other side, and keep the white wall side out, the pattern gets reversed. Now I asked, I have talked to them about this fire stone. That's uh, one of the things about this particular time, but a very popular tire and popular selling tire. But uh, it can run in either direction, but you know, uh, you can't search it either. You can only search it one way. <laughs> There's only one way it'll fit. It'll be, it would be really obvious to you if you try. Just put that thing on the wrong way. See what I mean. Now, um, once again, the location that you found fit, that fit, you could, uh, you could take a photograph of that spot and lay it over your photograph, kind of some photograph. So what I'm going to do is, this is the location that you found that matched, one, one of the four. I want you to take this and put it over your snow impression. So if we turn the lights on for a second, you had the impression number five, right? Okay, just try laying that. That's one of the areas that you found matched. Just lay it over your impression. When you do this, 
like you're inside the tire and you're looking right through the tread. So it might be a very effective way of demonstrating to the court um, why you think that this tire could have made that impression in snow. Because trying to show a jury something like that, it's kind of blurry and hard to see. So if you want to go into the extra step, and yours was number, number one. This was yours? Yeah. Um, Move it over. Lay that over to your photograph. Like an over. You'll see it can only go in one direction. Yeah. Move number two. Try laying that over your photograph to see where it matches up. Yeah, no, it's really down here. Okay. Get it to match. That's one of yours. <laughs> I don't like being inside a tire. Okay. Now, this is what I mean by you want to see these legs right here. I feel them up. Just drop them into the snow. Bottle. Pit seeping for the noise treatment. There's what a single unit looks like. It's just a little piece of the pad of the tread design with a couple elements. And model A had six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five. Those were the pitch lengths. An eight is the largest pitch length. So that's what was contained in the model A. And the model B. Model B has the same unit now. Um, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five. So we've got only two models here, an A and a B model. So we can flip those around and use them for the other side of the tire. You notice when you flip your transparency around, it fit both ways, searching, and it fit. Now the wear didn't match, but you could turn those around and get them. Okay. So we've got uh, that pitch sequence, and all we have to do is join them together like this. A model A and a model B together, and you've got three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So you just keep sticking the models together until you get around the circumference. And this is what it looked like on the mold drawing that we got to the Super 125. We've got uh, starting here, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, B, B. And there's the A. Six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five. Yes? Maybe I missed this. Uh, um, is it a model usually one-eighth of the circumference? No, it could be one-third. Okay, so uh, it wouldn't be one third, but it could be like uh, one tenth of the circumference, it could be one eighth, it could be one sixth. So this could have been made up of four models rather than eight models. Well, they'd be pretty long models. You know what I mean? A model is usually a fairly short section. No, or it could be made up of twice as many models as it actually was. You can't really yes. say how many it's made up of. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah, for a different size tire. Or even this tire, you can just divide A the model A into two different models, the model B into two different models, and how do you want to do that? Well, for, yeah, for different tires that could be, but for this particular tire, okay. this, this is what they did. Okay, I'm just saying you, you don't know that. There's no way you can know that unless you see the design. Right, okay. yeah. To figure out the pitch sequence and noise treatment and the model sequence, you have to get the drawings from the manufacturer. Yes. Unless you're really clever and you can figure out a pattern and spend a lot of time then finding, you know, using dividers and everything. You can see things repeating, and you can figure out, you know, it's, but you have to have a lot of knowledge. But you really don't need this information to do your searching, because you did the searching, found the place without it. But I'm just showing you uh, why um, you found it fit in uh, four places. You found it fit in four places. It's because they designed the tire this way, and this is the actual pitch sequence that they used. So we've got uh, four A models, four B models. 
And if this was a 15 or 14, it doesn't matter. You use the same number of models, just make them bigger or smaller. Any other questions? Okay. I'll take a break. <laughs>